Reading 82 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Uspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nichol, Volume 3. Great Amwell House, June 14, 1947. Further note on violence and understanding. Violence and fear. We spoke recently about understanding and how it is the most powerful force we can create. Force by itself, without understanding, naturally will tend to pass into violence. When a man acts through violence, he acts without his understanding. Violence lies in the self-will. Now, when a man acts through his understanding... He acts from the best in him, in regard to his level of knowledge and his level of being. The quality of his will, which chiefly belongs to the side of his being, and in a mechanical man is the resultant of his feelings and desires, and the quality of his learning, which chiefly belongs to the side of his knowledge, will determine whether under any given circumstances the man will act from violence or understanding. We can probably agree that we know better than we act. This means the level of being, which is that which acts, is lower than the level of knowledge, and so we often act from violence. Let me remind you again that in the work, people are looked at from two sides, the level of their knowledge and the level of their being. It is useful to look at everyone from this angle, especially at oneself. The question is not merely, what does the man know? Or where has he been or what job has he? But also, what is he like? What kind of man is he? Is he, for example, quarrelsome or conceited or unreliable or a thief, a liar, a slanderer? For all these belong to the quality of being. Now it is difficult and at first impossible to observe oneself when one is in a state of violence because As was said recently, when one is in a state of violence, one is completely asleep. One can, however, observe the state afterwards to a certain extent. The intellectual center will probably remember some of the expressions used, and the moving center will have recorded some of the gestures. But you will not be able to recall the emotion itself. When you pass out of a particular emotional state, it seems remote, even unreal. When you pass into it again, nothing is closer and more real. Take, for example, the state of fear, because we have to speak briefly about it. We know how, when we are not in a state of fear, fear seems unreal. Just think what things would be like if we could remember, in the emotional center, the horrors of war and feel the emotions again at will. But we cannot, and so everything goes on as it does. Ah, if we could in our personal life remember at will some healing emotions that visited us. Now there are, broadly speaking, two kinds of fear. There is instinctive fear, that is, fear originating in the emotional division of the instinctive center. This is present in us and in all animals, but of course differently oriented. This fear is stimulated only by the direct sensory impression of danger. It excites a secretion from the adrenal glands and releases material that activates the muscles, either for attack or for defense. This substance, adrenaline, although constantly manufactured in small quantities under normal safe conditions and in excess under abnormal unsafe conditions, can in a certain disease called Addison's disease be absent. In this case, the man is inert muscularly, practically unable to perform any muscular action. This has nothing to do with being lazy. From the angle of the work, third force is lacking. Now there is another origin of fear, 
which does not arise only when the senses recognize danger. This fear is situated in the emotional center and so is intimately connected with emotional imagination. Imagination is not nonsense, except in a literal sense, not springing from sense. It is a very powerful thing. It is useless to say to a person, it is nothing but imagination. To say a thing like that merely shows your ignorance, your lack of psychological understanding. For imagination, undirected imagination, exerts an incalculable influence on sleeping humanity. Suppose a person is always imaginatively afraid. This arises from the emotional center. He is afraid he may be buried alive, or afraid he has a serious illness, or afraid he will be suddenly attacked, or afraid he will fail in his exams, or that he may lose his money or position, and so on. All this is fear arising from the emotional center, and of course it is negative. That is, it arises from the manifold activities of the negative part of emotional center. It is not based on an actual sense-given situation. A rabbit seeing a dog dives into the burrow. Its fear is from the instinctive center, a direct response to a sensory stimulus. After a time, the rabbit emerges again. Just imagine if rabbits had emotional imaginative fear. They would never appear above ground. It is wonderful how they do. But this is not bravery. Now, fear in man leads to violence in many different ways. It could be said that a man may be taught to control instinctive fear, especially by discipline, but that to control emotional fear is far more difficult. It is indeed impossible, unless he has a form of faith, vision, and belief, through which he knows that he can do nothing and be nothing by himself, and that as long as he remembers himself, he will be helped, realizing that his life is not from himself. This faith, this belief, this vision is called catching the rope in the work, and it heals the emotional center. But if a man ascribes his life to himself, if he attributes everything he does, even digesting his food and making his heart beat to himself, then his emotional center is necessarily all wrong and, in fact, upside down. It is not internal considering that will lift fear, but external considering. He knows only self-emotions. He loves only himself. It is not this love that is meant in the phrase, love casteth out fear. As I said, it is not internal considering that will lift fear, but external considering. I will ask once more, how do you move? How do you think? How do you feel? In short, the emotional center is wrong unless it is increasingly susceptible to the feelings that come from ideas such as that we did not create ourselves and that this life is not explicable in terms of itself. Now, all the emotions opened up by sufficient contact with the work begin to purify the emotional center and lessen fear. That leads to the elimination of fear and so to the gradual cessation of violence arising from this source. A man who only believes in himself must obviously have many unnecessary fears which may lead to violence. He will naturally suspect others. Suspicion gives rise easily to violence. With the decline of vision today, there is automatically a rise in suspicion and fear on all sides. You know the kind of man who suddenly walks up to you and says, You are not laughing at me by any chance. Now such a man believing in himself, attributing everything to himself, admiring himself, and having many amazing pictures of himself, will tend to violence because, for one reason, he cannot laugh at himself. If one were to say to him, 
I am laughing at an I in you, but not at you. I am afraid you would measure your length on the floor. Now, as regards the purification of the emotional center, since we ascribe everything to ourselves, even our brains, we have only self-emotions. Self-emotions may lead eventually to violence. I advise some of you to read Mr. Uspensky's chapter on the emotions in his first book, Tertium Organum. Now, on the practical side, all this work is about making what lies in your being more and more conscious. That is, bringing out into the light of consciousness what has always acted mechanically in you, so far, and perhaps spoilt your life. In this respect, it is useful to observe what kind of fear makes you violent. Do you fear not to be properly treated, for instance? I am not speaking of instinctive fear. If you begin to see the connection between some forms of violence and some not hitherto realized or acknowledged fear, then you will find that this connection, exposed more and more to the light of consciousness by means of self-observation, will operate less and less powerfully. In other words, whereas you acted mechanically, now you see and begin to act consciously. This is a change of being. 